1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to begin at verse 10. 1 Samuel chapter 15, beginning at verse 10. You'd stand today with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. I'm going to talk to us for a little while today on the topic of playing by the rules. Playing by the rules. 1 Samuel chapter 15, beginning at verse 10. And the word of the Lord reads, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set him up a place, and is gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto him, uh, unto Saul, stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, and wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel, and the Lord sent thee on a journey, and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites, but the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Well, that's quite a story, isn't it? Saul had a lot to lose, and he lost it. And he lost it all for one simple reason. He didn't play by the rules. Amen. He didn't obey what God had asked him to do. Would you bow your heads with me? Master, we thank you again for this day. We thank you, God, for your word. Lord, you placed a message in my spirit for this hour, and God, as I'm about to, prove, to deliver it, I ask that your anointing would rest heavily upon me. God, allow me, Lord, this hour to present it with boldness, and with power, God, with great fervor, so that the people of God might receive from you that which you would have them to receive from this message. God, anoint us today from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. Anoint the hearer to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. For we ask it today, God, in none other than the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated today, if you like. Amen. Playing by the rules, a concept which is so easily understood when it comes to matters of recreation or even matters relative to the workplace. You know, when we go to work, sometimes we got to do things we don't necessarily like to do, but we know we have to do it if we're going to get by. Am I right? Amen. 
Sometimes when you're dealing with your family, there are certain things you got to do. I love my grandmother to death, but sometimes she drives me up the wall. And I know when I'm dealing with my grandmother, there are certain rules that I've got to follow if I'm going to get along okay. You know what I'm saying? Amen. A lot of people understand the concept of playing by the rules, but when it comes to matters of theology and faith, so many want to believe that God is so benevolent that the rules simply don't matter, Brother Willie. That's what a lot of people want to believe. You see... It's, it's okay to understand that electricity is black and white. It's okay to understand that the rules of nature and the laws of nature are absolute. If you stick your hand into that socket, you're going to get electrocuted. Well, I don't believe I will. Well, it's all right. You don't have to believe it. Go ahead and do it. It's going to happen. Amen. You see, it's easy to understand that the laws of nature are absolute. It's easy to understand that the, the laws of the natural world are absolute. But when it comes to the laws of God, we want to believe that there's all kinds of play, that there's all kinds of flexibility, that we don't have to do things God's way. We don't have to do what God said to do and how we said to do it. My Lord have mercy. A lot of people play games with their soul salvation because they want to be stubborn. <clears throat> there are a lot of people that are just pure, D, outright uh, rebellious. Well, I know what it says, but I'm not going to do it. I know what the Bible teaches, but that's all right. I'm not going to do it anyway. God will understand when I get to heaven that I just didn't want to do that for this reason or that reason. No, God isn't the one that's going to understand nothing. You're the one that's going to understand that you didn't play by the rules. And just like in that, uh, some of these television reality shows, you're going to be standing before the Lord one day and he's going to look strangely like Donald Trump and he's going to say, fired. You're fired. Amen. Or suddenly he's going to look like that woman in black uh, garb who stands up and says, You are the missing link. Goodbye. Because you didn't play by the rules. One of the wonderful things about an affirming church is we understand that the rules, Brother Willie, are simple. The rules are easy. It's not difficult. It's not hard to serve God. God has made it so easy that the average income poop on the street can make it into heaven if he wants to. Amen. That's one of the wonderful things about God. He isn't trying to make this thing hard. He isn't trying to make this thing difficult. He isn't trying to keep people out. He's trying to let people in. But when he tells you what you need to do, and you don't even want to do that, uh-oh, now there's a problem. Here Saul was, king over Israel, had probably the greatest position in all the world. For he represented the nation that represented the true God, the one true and living God. And Saul sat there and came back from battle on this day, having gone out against the Amalekites, receiving orders from the Lord that he should destroy every Amalekite and everything relative to them. You know, sometimes if you're going to get something out of your life, if you want to get sin out of your life, if you want to get something that's not only just pleasing to God but self-destructive to you, it's not enough to stop buying the pot. But you also got to throw away the pot pipes. Come on now. You also got to get rid of the bong, all right? You know what I'm talking about? You also got to burn up the papers, the zigzags, or whatever they used to call them. I don't even know what they are anymore. But, uh, you know, sometimes you got to kill everything relative to it to make sure it's dead and it's buried and it's out of your life. Amen. Well, I'm trying to stop drinking. Well, then, honey, pour your Jack Daniels down the drain. Come on now. Oh, but it's too expensive. 
to pour down the drain. Uh, honey, it'll be far more expensive if you wind up going back into that junk because you're keeping it handy. Sometimes God says you've got to destroy the enemy and everything relative to it if you're going to keep victory. My Lord have mercy. Whoa, this just sounds like old-time Pentecost now, don't it? Well, Brother Martin, you don't even sound like an affirming preacher anymore. All of a sudden, you're sounding kind of harsh. You're kind of sounding strict. That's because I'm in the business of trying to help me people make heaven. It's why I'm here. I'm not here playing no game. You think I've been playing for 11 years? I've preached in New York City four years. I've preached in Connecticut two years. I've preached in Atlanta almost a year. I've come to Dallas, been here almost three years. You think I've been doing this because this is a game for me? I have not made one single paycheck in the entire time that I've been doing this. This is serious business, people. I'm here because God wants you to make heaven. And he wants you to understand that who you are is not an obstacle but what you do or what you do not do may be. Amen. The plan of salvation is simple. It's clear. It's articulated by the Apostle Peter in Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Not in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. No, Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ. And then he went on to say why we do that. He said, for the remission of sins. The Bible says there is remission in no other name than in the name of Jesus Christ. If you want your sins remitted, honey, I've got news for you. It better be the name of Jesus that's being spoken over you in the waters of baptism. Because if it's all Rome's formula, a Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, there is no power in those words. Demons do not tremble when you come against them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. But when you say to a demon, oh, devil, come out in Jesus' name, they come out without an argument. I don't understand people who don't understand baptism in Jesus' name. How in the world can you do anything wrong and do it in Jesus' name? My Bible tells me, the Apostle Paul says, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. That's what he said. My Bible tells me in Acts 4 and 12, for there is no other name given among men under heaven whereby we must be saved. I don't understand why people make a big issue. Well, but I was baptized this way, or I was baptized that way. Honey, I don't care if you were baptized in honey and fed to the flies. If it's not the right way, then you need to do it the right way. It's that simple. It's called playing by the rules. God don't take lightly to people trying to do things their own way when he has told them how to do it, and he's made it preciously clear and vividly clear for them. Here was Saul, a great king. God had established him as king over Israel. And yet when Saul decided that he wasn't going to do it quite the way the Lord said, he was going to do it his own way. He was going to make his own rules. Look what happened. God himself said, I have repented. What does that mean? I have turned around. I have changed my mind concerning Saul's position as king over Israel. I've changed my mind, Cody. I have changed my mind. A lot of people will stand before God one day and find out that God has changed his mind concerning them because they wanted to play by their own rules rather than playing by God's rules. not a matter of being angry. God didn't say nothing about being angry, Brother Willie. God didn't say nothing about being wroth with Saul. No, he said, I've changed my mind. You can change your mind and stay perfectly calm, cool, and collected, can't you? 
Amen. It don't have nothing to do with hating nobody. It don't have nothing to do with being angry with anybody. It just means that you have had a change of heart and a change of mind and a change of position, and you plan on doing things differently than you've been doing it. Isn't it amazing that when we read in our Bibles, when we look back in our Bibles to the lineage of King Jesus in the book of Matthew, isn't it amazing that the Lord's lineage as a king and as a potentate in Israel is traced back all the way to who? His great, 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 great grandfather David. Well, what about Saul? Saul's place in the lineage and Saul's place in history has literally been cut out, Brother Willie. It was no longer there. You see, you don't play with God. God says, I've, let it, I've set it out. It's there for you. It's very simple. It's not hard. All I want you to do is obey. That's all I'm asking you to do. Saul couldn't find a place of obedience, but rather he found himself in a place where he was doing things his own way. And Saul lost his place in all that God was going to do, not just in this world and in this age, but in all of eternity. Saul lost his place. I'll tell you what, I don't want to lose my place with God. Whatever God, whatever place God has for me in the scheme of things, I want to be right in the middle of it. Amen. I want to realize everything that God has called me to do. I don't want to miss one iota of the blessing or the promise that God promises to those who will walk in obedience and in faith. Amen. Do you know the Bible teaches that there is blessing associated with faith and obedience? But it also tells us there's a curse associated with disobedience and unbelief. Am I right? Amen. I want to walk in faith. I want to walk in a place of obedience. If I read in the scriptures tomorrow that God wanted me to dip my head in a hot, a hot cup of tea, then Brother Joaquin, I want to dip my head in a hot cup of tea. Who am I to question God? I don't know why he has set forth certain things, but I know that if he set it forth, it's there for my benefit and not for my detriment. I know if he's put it there, it's not there to hurt me, it's there to help me. Amen? So listen now, the way of the gospel of Christ is indeed narrow. We think that God's so benevolent that His rules don't matter, but i got news for you. It's God who made the rules. So why in the world should we think that He would ignore or break His own rules, His own invention? The way of the gospel of Christ is narrow. It does not leave the door open to approach God through Muhammad or Baal or Buddha or Vishnu or whomever you might want to name. No, to find God, one must come through the way of Christ. For Colossians 2 and 9 declares plainly, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If you want to find God, you better be looking at Jesus. Because if you're looking anywhere else, he's not there. There's a lot of people that want to follow their own rules, but that's not God's rules. God said, if you want to find me, you better look in the person of the man, Jesus Christ. In John chapter 14, in verse 6, the Lord Jesus Christ declared, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, Joaquin, no exceptions, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The only way you can possibly reach God the Father is through the man Jesus Christ. Saul had a great deal to lose by reason of his disobedience. He had the throne of David on the line. Why do you think today the lineage of Christ points back to David and not to Saul? Because Saul thought he could do what God commanded him not to do. And at, at some point, Saul believed he could cut corners and get sloppy. And the Lord would still allow him to 
remain king over Israel. But children, he could not have been more wrong. You see, the issue here this morning is very simple. My message is very simple this morning. It's about obedience, plain and simple. It's about doing what the Lord asks you to do. Brother Cody, the reason that we'll be baptizing you in Jesus' name this evening is because that's what the Lord would ask you to do, and we're going to do it. Amen. And if, if that's what the Word of God requires of us, then that's what we're going to do. Amen. And do you know, in all my years before I came into the apostolic movement, I never baptized a single soul in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I never, I had opportunity to baptize, and I never did. And do you know, I'm so grateful looking back. Because I feel like I would have been uh, contributing to people's misconceptions and false ideas about things. And I'm just so grateful. And Lord, thank you that I never took the opportunity to baptize anybody in that way. The only way I have ever baptized anybody in my entire ministry has been in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Hallelujah. 2 Kings 5, verses 9 through 14, tells us the story of a man named Naaman who was a leper. And he was told by his wife's uh, young maiden that, that he ought to go to the land of Israel and seek out the prophet of God because he would be able to heal him of his leprosy. And the long and the short of it is, Naaman goes to the house and the prophet of God doesn't even come to the door. He just sends his servant to the door. And Naaman tells him, why he's there, and I've been recommended by one of your people to come and see the prophet of God, the man of God. And the servant goes back to his master, to the prophet, and tells him, and the prophet says, well, you tell this man to go to the River Jordan and dip seven times in the River Jordan. So the servant goes back down and tells Naaman, the, the man of God said, to go dip seven times in the river Jordan. Naaman's upset. Well, why in the world would I dip in that muddy old dirty river? You see, the Jordan River is a very silty river. It's a very dirty river by nature. He said, why in the world would I dip seven times in that dirty old filthy Jordan River? We've got rivers where I come from that run ten times more pure and ten times more clean. Well, I'm just going to go home. This is a bunch of bugs. I'm not getting anything out of this. This was a wasted trip. And in his anger and frustration, he's on his way back to his camel, and all of a sudden, one of his servants runs up and says, Master, if the prophet had told you to do this or to do that or some simple thing, or even because Naaman was a man of war, he said, even if he had told you to go and fight a battle and when you win it, you'll be healed, he said, you wouldn't have done any of those things. So why is it a hard thing to do what he's asking you to do now? Amen. Why is it so hard to do what God asks us to do sometimes? What are our excuses? The river's dirty? <laughs> well, I can't obey the scriptures and be baptized in Jesus' name. Why? Well, because my family raised me to believe a certain way, and I was baptized that way, and I've got to honor them. You know, it's funny because Saul tried to blame the people, too. Amen. You remember our text this morning? Saul turned around and said to Samuel, he said, well, I went to do what God commanded me to do, but the people spared some of the animals and spared some of the oxen and some of the sheep in order to offer them as a sacrifice. Now, come, so who's king? You and them. Do the people tell you what to do, or do you tell them what to do? Which one of y'all are leading? This is one of the things I try to tell folks when they need to obey the gospel. If you'll 
do the right thing, you'll find over time that you're leading others into the right thing. That's why the Bible said, if you recall, when the Philippian jailer ran into Paul and Silas in prison after the prison doors had been uh, shaken open by a great earthquake, and uh, he said, what must I do? And the Philippian jailer heard the answer from Paul. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thine house. Because if you'll leave, they'll follow. If you'll come in, they'll come in. Don't worry about following them. Worry about leading. Come on now. Don't worry about being disobedient to God because of what they're doing. Think about being obedient to God, and they'll follow you. But you see, it takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of fortitude and strength of character to be able to do the right thing and obey the voice of God when it goes against everything and everybody. I remember Brother Willie when I was a young preacher and I finally wrestled with the issue of Jesus' name baptism and the one God message. I struggled with it for such a long time. It wasn't the issue that I struggled with because the issue was clear. I couldn't debate it. I couldn't argue with it. I couldn't tell them they were wrong because they weren't wrong. Amen. I couldn't. But do you know what had me all hung up? Well, I pastored in the Church of God, and the Church of God folks are some of the best folks I know. And why, if I go into that apostolic movement, I'm going to have to turn my back on all them good Church of God folks. And, and, and I'm going to have to believe that they don't have anything in God and that they don't have any relationship with God and they don't have this and that. And the Lord says, well, that's foolish. I never said you had to believe that. But you can still love the folks. They're still, they're still good people. They're still trying to live godly. They're still trying to the best of their knowledge to do the right thing, which is more than I can say for you. The scripture teaches us to him that knoweth to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Did you hear that? When you know the right thing to do and you choose not to do it, it's sin. Isn't that funny? It doesn't say when you know the wrong thing to do and you do it, and you do the wrong thing. No. When you know the right thing to do, but you don't do it, it's the same as doing the wrong thing. You following me? The Bible also teaches us that God is going to hold every man accountable according to his ability to receive. The scripture teaches us to walk in the light as we have the light. As God has illuminated your pathway of understanding and allowed you to see and understand certain issues and certain things, uh, children, God don't illuminate your pathway so that you can stand there and look at it from afar. He illuminates it so you can get on it and walk in it. He don't want you to look at the light. He wants you to walk in the light. Amen? You ever been out on a real, real, real dark night and maybe you uh, stepped out in front of a car that had its headlights on? And you couldn't see nothing from side to side. You couldn't see hardly nothing at all. But you know the wise thing to do in that instance is to walk in the light. To stay where the light is. That way if there's anything in front of you that shouldn't be there, you'll see it. Come on now. Do you think it's an accident today that God's allowed you to be in our church? No, it's not an accident. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come under repentance. God wants everybody to understand this great apostolic message. You may be the bell sheep that leads your whole family into this thing. Amen. You may be the bell sheep. You know what a bell sheep is? That's the, the little lamb that used to tie a bell around. Usually it would be the one that was the most obedient, the one that would act right, the one that would do what it was told. And that way the shepherd, all he'd have to do is he'd have to lead the bell sheep 
because the bell sheep do whatever it's told. It's a good, obedient little lamb. And he leads the bell sheep, and that little bell around his neck would go, chee -ha, chee -ha, chee -ha, chee -ha, chee -ha, and all the other sheep would just follow him for the noise. But the bell sheep had to be obedient. It had to do the right thing to become a bell sheep to be able to lead others. And friend, that's what God wants his people to be. He doesn't want us to be a bunch of followers. He wants us to be a bunch of leaders. Amen. He wants us by example to lead our family into the way of truth. But he wants us by example to lead our family and our friends into this great, wonderful, apostolic gospel way. Amen. Saul sat there and tried to blame the people. No, Saul, it ain't about that. Because now what you're trying to tell us is that you're a follower rather than a leader. And if you're a follower rather than a leader, you don't even deserve to be king. My Lord, have mercy. You know, Naaman might have lost out on his miracle if he had not humbled himself and did as the prophet had commanded him. So many of us miss out on God's blessings for our lives because we choose to rebel against the word of God and stubbornly hold tight to old beliefs and childhood doctrines. But the Word of God told us this morning in our primary text that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is a detestable thing in the sight of God. God doesn't take too lightly that stubbornness and rebellion. He doesn't take too well to it. James 4, 7 through 10 tells us, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. You know what double-minded means, uh, Tony? That means somebody can't make up their mind which way to go. He said, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your Purify your heart, get double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaven. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. If we we'll walk in humility and obedience, God will exalt us. God will bless us. God will help us. I had an 89-year-old lady in Grove City, Pennsylvania, come into my little church there, Jason and I, my former partner. We were pastoring a little church there in Grove City. Her name was Bowser, Sister Bowser. That's the street Jose and Curry live on is Bowser. And uh, Sister Bowser was 89 years old, Brother Willie. She had a very severe heart condition, and the doctor said that she could not live without open heart surgery. She had to have heart catheters put in. She had to have a pacemaker installed, all kind of stuff. And she was due to go in for surgery on a Friday morning at a Pittsburgh hospital. And on Wednesday, Jason and I went to visit a friend of ours, a minister who pastored an apostolic church out in Sharon, Pennsylvania which is about 30 minutes uh, west of Grove City. We went to visit Brother McCoy, and we went, we spent the day with him, and we went out to dinner with him. We had a nice visit and all that, you know. But on our way out to meet with Brother McCoy, Brother Willie, I fell into a spirit of intercession. See, that's something you don't hardly hear about no more, isn't it? That's something a lot of Pentecostal folk and a lot of these big fancy quote-unquote Pentecostal churches wouldn't even know about. But I fell into a spirit of intercession because I knew that Sister Hazel had never been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And I knew that as early as Friday morning she might be facing her maker. And I said, oh God, I don't push these issues on people. I don't try to push people into obeying the word of God and doing the right thing. I just give them the opportunity. I've never pushed these people, but I've given them plenty of opportunity. 
out in the spirit, get to shouting. <laughs> Jason didn't say nothing. He left me alone. I passed my exit. Drove all the way into Ohio. Turned around in Columbus, came back. <laughs> I was in intercession, brother. I, what can I tell you? Come all the way back, meet with Brother McCoy. I told him about this lady in my church. She needs to be baptized. Tears streaming down my face. I said, Brother McCoy, this lady needs to be baptized before she goes in for surgery. I said, Dear Jesus, what if she has to face God? What if she has to face her judge? She hasn't done all that she knows to do, and I know she knows to do it because I preach it, and she comes every Sunday and listens. To him that knoweth to do good, and does it not, to him it is sin. I said, Lord, what are we going to do? And Brother McCoy prayed with us for her as well. And then on the way home, I just prayed for her even more. Get back to the house I had borrowed her daughter's car to make this trip, Sylvia's car, and as Sylvia was dropping Jason and I off where we lived at, she said, Brother Morrow, there's something that Mom and I have been talking about that we'd like to talk to you about. She said, you know, Mom's going in Friday morning for open heart surgery, and the doctors have said her chance of surviving the surgery is like 20%. But if she don't have the surgery, her chances of surviving the month are very slim. She said, well, Mom and I have been talking about it, and neither one of us has ever been baptized in Jesus' name. She said, we want to be baptized in Jesus' name. I about went through the roof of that car. <laughs> I was so happy. I was so delirious. That was the answer to my prayer right there. I said, I'll call Brother McCoy. I called Brother McCoy and Sharon. I said, Brother, can we come to your church and use your baptistry? He said, Absolutely. He said, Why don't you all come tomorrow night? Because we have a service tomorrow night, and that way after the service we can all participate and, and be there with you as you baptize these folks. I said, That works for me. So we went up and joined them in service that Thursday night. After the service, we went downstairs, their baptistry, a little black church, about 120 people. Uh, actually, very mixed church, but had a baptistry downstairs. It was nothing more than a great big old cow trough, you know, with a cover over it and all that, you know. That's how Sylvia. Then here comes Sister Bowser, and as Sister Bowser gets in the water, and I'm getting ready to baptize her, I said to her, Sister Bowser, there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. There is no power in the words, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but there is power in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe God's going to heal you while you're in the water of baptism today. My grandmother, my great-grandmother, the saintly little Portuguese lady I've told you about, God healed her of a severe flu that she had when she was baptized in Jesus' name. She went in the water sick, come up whole. So I turned around and Brother McCoy helped me because Sister Bowser was so skinny and so frail and old. And Brother McCoy helped me lower her into the water. And we pulled her up out of that water. Brother, brother, brother Cody, I want you to know, you could feel the electricity just swimming all over that woman. It was so bad. And I, I haven't experienced this a lot in my life, I'm going to tell you. But it was so heavy on her that Brother McCoy and I both had to pull our hands away because we could not touch her. It was like touching an electric wire. And she was staggering in the water like this, just not hard able to, and we're trying to make sure she doesn't fall, but we can't touch her either. When we finally got her up out of that water and we took her the next morning for surgery, Jason and I, Sylvia, one of her granddaughters, another one of her daughters, and Sister Bowser, I drove the minivan because Sylvia was too nervous. And I drove us down to Pittsburgh, and we got her checked into that hospital that day. While she was waiting to go into surgery, being prepped, she asked for me to come in the room. I went in the room, and she said, can you just pray for me one more time? 
I said, honey, I believe God's already touched you. She said, I do too. She said, but now I'm just nervous. I said, okay. So I anointed her with oil and prayed for her one more time. Then we turned around and we went out in the waiting room and we were waiting and waiting and waiting for a few hours. And after a little bit, we found out Sister Sylvia had been put in a private room. And I'm sorry, Sister Bowser, Sister uh, Bowser had been put in a private room. And Sylvia was the daughter. And Sylvia said, She's not supposed to be in a private room. She's supposed to be in recovery for a couple of days. They said she was going to be in recovery for a couple of days. She's not supposed to be in a private room. What happened? So we're going to the room to try to find the doctor to find out what happened. And as we're walking toward the room, out comes the surgeon. And the surgeon says, halfway down the hallway, I don't know what this lady's been eating for 89 years, but she better keep eating it. He said her heart is perfect. Woo! Glory! He said her muscle is perfect. He said her valves are perfect. He said her arteries are perfect. The daughter said, well, did you put in the pacemaker? He said she didn't need the pacemaker. She, he said, what about the medication that she's been on? He said she doesn't need the medication that she's been on. And this unsafe daughter that was standing there said, you're going to tell me two heart specialists said that this woman was dying with a heart that was failing. And you're telling me it's perfect. Sylvia shouted all the way around the church, around the hospital. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. God healed her. God healed her. That's what she said right there in front of the doctor. I'm going to tell you, friend, there's blessing in obedience. You don't know what you're missing out sometimes when you act the fool and you fight God. And you want to do it your way rather than his way. You don't know what you're missing out when you don't want to play by the rules. If you'll play by the rules, you have everything to win and nothing to lose. But if you play by your rules, you have everything to lose and nothing to gain. Am I right? Lord Jesus, have mercy. In closing tonight... The Word of God states in 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin, begin at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? And then in closing, Matthew 7, 21 through 29, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon a rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these things of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So you see, children today, the bottom line is, if you play by the rules, you're a wise man. If you play by your own rules, you're a foolish man. If you play by the rules, you stand before God. You're standing on a firm foundation. You try to play by your own rules, and you one day stand before God. And children, you're going to be standing on sinking sand. Nothing to hold.